Poznałem Martina Godarta w Londynie za sprawą naszego gościa, który kiedyś u nas również w tej galerii miał wystawę, Dżamirowskiego. Panowie się przyjaźnią od wielu lat i Johna mówił Martina, żeby, żebyśmy przy okazji festiwalu Sound Edit zorganizowali mu wystawę zdjęć. I to się właśnie teraz dzieje. 40 prac właściwie ikonicznych fotografii, które wszyscy doskonale znamy, choćby pierwsza okładka płyty zespołu The Cure, Three Imaginary Boys, albo zdjęcie Fila Collinsa, które też wszyscy doskonale znają, czy Elton John skaczący nad swoim basenem, koncertowe zdjęcia Queenów, e, duet Wham na pierwszej trasie w Chinach. Była to pierwsza w ogóle trasa zespołu zagranicznego w Chinach. Debbie, Harry i Blondie, można by tak wymieniać. E, niestety Martin do nas nie dotarł w tym roku, ale e, uczynił nam wielki honor, że pozwolił w ogóle tę wystawę zorganizować. Udzielił nam wszelkich praw i licencji do tego, żebyśmy mogli ją tutaj wydrukować oraz nagrał nam e, fajne filmy, które opowiadają historię kilku z tych zdjęć i zach zachęcam też gorąco, żeby to sobie na spokojnie wszystko obejrzeć. Myślę, że on do, on do nas wróci, bo on nigdy nie był w Polsce i tak bardzo był tą wizją e, zakręcony i podpalony, kiedy widziałem się z nim jeszcze w lutym w Londynie. No ale to wtedy zaczęło się już całe to światowe szaleństwa, ponieważ on miał jakieś kłopoty zdrowotne, więc postanowił jednak bezpiecznie zostać w Londynie, ale to kiedyś wszystko minie i Martin Goddard do nas przyleci. Hello Poland, it's Martin Goddard. I'm really sorry I'm not with you and I really wish I could be there uh, to see the exhibition. Uh, I've seen photographs of it um, on emails and online and it looks terrific the, the way the gallery have put on the display. So what I thought I'd do is just go through a few of the pictures uh, and give you some sort of insight into what happened when I took them, why I took them, how I took them. Uh, I'll keep it as brief as possible because some of these things can go on and on. Um, so let's start at the beginning of the list I was given by the gallery. Uh, Phil Collins of Genesis. Uh, the picture on display is a picture of him between two speakers in his own sound recording in Surrey, England. The picture was taken in 1984 for a man's magazine. It wasn't a rock magazine, it was a sort of like um, a young professionals magazine called Options for Men. Um, the reason the shoot went so well, because Phil Collins is just a, a born actor and he plays to the camera, plays to the stage, obviously, as you've seen his live performances. Uh, and I need to go back to 1981, really, to see why the shoot at his home and his studio went so well. Uh, I was commissioned by um, the record company and by a magazine called Sunday Express in the UK to go on the Genesis Abercam tour. The idea was to go on the tour and just live on the road the way I've done many times before and give a complete coverage for the magazine. Uh, the band were great, they let me hang around in all areas, I had access all areas and um, because it was such a vast tour, uh, there were so many aspects to photograph. Um, I've got a book here, uh, my book, and uh, I'll be using it if I need to sort of crib my notes on it a bit. But the whole thing about the tour was I, I was able to go to several gigs and it gave me a chance to plan the shoot. The, the other sh um, aim of the shoot was to produce the cover for Three Sides Live for the record company. So that was why it was important to plan the shoot. Uh, so I knew all the um, songs, the lightings for the songs, and I could pick moments. In fact, I used um, the shots from the Olympia Halle uh, in Munich at the Olympic Stadium um, for the uh, record cover. But I'd already practiced at previous gigs. Um, so the thing is, I got to know the bands really well. They were very professional. <laughs> It wasn't exactly, uh, how can I say, an out there tour in that the band, once they'd uh, finished their gig, they would go to the bar, have a drink, uh, they would go to bed because they were tired, and then uh, all the roadies and the rest of the crew spent all their time bowling and every other damn thing that could be done um, on the tour, as one does on the tour. So I knew the band, and so when I was commissioned to go and see Phil at his home, I already knew him, and so that helped en enormously. Um, with these sort of shoots um, at their homes, it usually lasted a day, 
because by the time you'd met them mid-morning and you'd, you sort of walked around and decided what you were going to do and the shoot had to be a repertoire shoot, a shoot that would, uh, was, was um, him in his home, him in his garden, him in his village so um, it was quite a, a long affair but at the end of the day uh, he was going to do some recording so we went into his own personal recording studio and um, it was very dark in there and I had to push the film um, technically way beyond its limits really um, but I thought it was just interesting and he sort of popped up behind the, um, the soundboard between the speakers and uh, I just happened to take the picture and uh, I've always liked that picture because it's so spontaneous and it's very the cheeky chappy that um, Phil Collins was so um, I think that sort of gives you some sort of insight um, relationship with the band really important and uh, shooting perhaps beyond the technical limits but the image is more important than the uh, technical limits that are involved next subject The Cure The Cure is a band I've never met uh, the funny thing is that the um, three imaginary boys covers came from uh, working with Bill Smith, an art director I'd worked with the Jam on the In the City cover, and he had met the band, but they didn't want to be in the pictures. They, they were preferred an abstract feel, and, and, to, and to go with this imaginary theme, we decided, Bill and myself, to imagine what we would do for the cover, and the imagination was to use old um, home utility items to represent the three imaginary boys. Uh, we came up with a, an old 50s refrigerator, uh, I think it was a Lek, uh, a Hoover, a classic sort of uh, upright Hoover, and a standard lamp. So we managed to get these places from second-hand and junk shops close to the studio, which is in central London. So we assembled this stuff uh, in the studio and um, made our imaginary three boys. But it was originally on a white background and I didn't particularly think that it stood out and it had the impact and I've been doing a bit of fashion photography at the time in the same studio and had a couple of rolls of pink paper, it's bright pink, we call it shocking pink um, and I chose that uh, and, and Bill agreed it looked cool and so we used that background um, to well, I give a, a pretty striking image that's pretty striking today. In fact, it's the only album I think I've got in the top 20 albums of all time that you must have, or some cover of that description. So, interesting that I never did another shoot with The, uh, the Cure. Uh, a shame, because I love their music. Um, but um, that's how that album cover came about. The next item. <laughs> Ian Anderson, lead singer, flottist, well, dynamic force behind Jethro Tull. Um, I'd actually been working with him uh, in 1979, and in fact there are other pictures in the tour, uh, in, not in the tour, in, in the um, exhibition that were taken on the 1979 meet. But the flight case picture that is used in the poster, um, and that is Ian's hand, holding the flute coming out of the flight case, um, was taken for the Broadsword album tour. Um, I shot many of the tour programmes for Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull because Ian had this concept that uh, he must have value for money, he wanted a, 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 a tour programme that had lots of interesting content, uh, writing, photography, graphics, and it uh, wasn't um, a rip-off. Um, if you paid your money for the, the programme, you had something to read and something to keep afterwards. So I did this broad, broad tour, broad sword tour um, programme, and we shot it mostly at Pinewood Studios where they were rehearsing. They were using the sound stage there. Uh, in the sound stage, uh, obviously they could rehearse as if it was the actual concert, and so I was able to use. Um, all the facilities and they'd taken all their gear uh, in the flight cases and uh, we had this idea of let's get him in the flight case and make him as if he was on tour. So that's how that picture came about and it came about because uh, Ian is really up for it. He, if, if you come up with an idea that he really likes he will actually get into it, uh, he can see the idea working and he really puts heart and soul into it and, and it, that is uh, the same now um, as it was then. The next picture is from my punk era, 1978. 
it was the Debbie Harry trip to New York. Uh, I was commissioned not by a record company, but I was actually asked by a magazine in England called the Telegraph Sunday Magazine. Uh, this magazine uh, is given away with Sunday newspaper, it was very high end. Um, but I went to, I've been working for this magazine for uh, a year or so, and I went to the uh, editor of the magazine and asked if I paid my airfare, which was quite cheap then, I think £99 are, uh, on a standby, to New York, would he run the pictures uh, if he liked them? Um, this editor said yes, we'd do that, but he'd want to see the pictures and they'd pay me on the usage of the pictures. So I got in the plane and went over to New York, my first visit to New York, uh, so I was a bit starry eyed by the place, and I was staying at Gramercy Park Hotel, um, which was a hotel where Debbie Harry was staying, so it had all been organised, they were living there at the time, and I was able to um, get to know the band really well over the week or so I was there. Um, we came up, this was a sort of idea I wanted to do for the cover of the magazine, was to uh, take Debbie Harry, who had always been a bit wild, and this magazine I was working for was a bit upmarket, and they suggested, and I suggested as well, that we should see if we could get a hairdresser to do her hair and style her up and, and, and do a full makeup job. Uh, by complete chance, uh, it was London Fashion Week in New York, uh, and I knew one of the hairdressers and makeup artists who'd worked. Uh, with me in London, uh, a, gal a, a company called Shumi, and uh, they came in and um, they did the whole works on Debbie. Uh, she thought it was amazing, um, she thought it was interesting, and uh, she was up for it. And I shot the cover and uh, the entire article in the Gramercy Park um, rooms, the suite of rooms where um, they were staying, and the rooftop uh, area, and an old cocktail bar. So I was able to do quite interesting shots in this sort of Art Deco hotel. But I wanted something really striking um, to go with the cover for a lead shot. And so I'd taken out a white label from um, the record company, Chrysalis, of her um, Plastic Letters album. And um, asked her to kiss it. And then we set it up uh, in this suite, uh, which was acting as my studio. Uh, and she was idea was to have her head very close to this white label but just for one frame she stuck her tongue out and licked it and by complete luck skill whatever you want to call it um, I was able to catch that shot uh, and that shot has become iconic I hate that word but it has um, it was used uh, by the record company for the picture disc of parallel lines in Europe uh, I may say the wrong way round but it, it was used uh, and it's also been used by um, Atlantic Records um, as a sort of image that uh, young bands should aspire to, uh, the sort of out there punk rock and roll type image that um, they would like to see from their young clients. So uh, that's the story of that picture. It's been uh, the, the picture that is plastered all over the front of the gallery uh, in your lovely town um, is the original transparency, which shows all the um, uh, 35 mil sprockets. The jam. The jam are probably the well, most interesting band I photographed because I photographed them right from the very beginning. Uh, they were signed by Polydor Records and they were really keen on the, putting the album in the city out really quickly. So they gave the design of the cover to a young in-house guy called Bill Smith and he wanted to do a sort of street scene, night scene in a subway or with graffiti, perhaps tiled wall, band caught in headlights from outside, sort of an earthy sort of streetwise picture. I mean, I was really keen on, on the band and uh, I love the way their style in the mod gear, um, but I really didn't think we could shoot it on the run and do a really good job uh, shooting on location, especially as we wanted to spray graffiti on tiled walls. And so I said, well, let's do it in the studio. We can, we can build a tile wall, which um, we did. We went down the local hardware store and bought crystal tiles and Bill and I covered the two 8x4 flats um, with the tiles and then Bill 
handwritten with a, the uh, the aerosol can. He shook the thing up and uh, just he had one take at it. Did the logo, which has been the logo for the band since the beginning. Um, the story goes from then, really. Uh, um, the band came in. They, they were a young band. I had a, a hair and makeup artist, and uh, uh, that was all sort of cool. They, they, they were really into it. They loved the idea of the graffiti. They loved the tile wall, and uh, they they really sort of uh, put themselves together with uh, all the right clothes. Uh, there was a slight problem in that they, they for this shoot they they still had trainers. Uh, they hadn't quite got into the the, the loafer shoes, which we were able to to get at later. Um, but the band was soon on key and uh, I only shot five rolls of film on my Hasselblad uh, after the two or three Polaroid test pictures. Uh, that Paul Weller, who was sort of the creative uh, spark in the band, um, he loved the shot, the rest of them did too. And um, apparently uh, the first frame of the first film is the picture that was used on th this cover. Um, the record company loved it, even the black and white, they were a bit sort of hesitant uh, that a black and white cover would work when Bill even changed the logo to blue rather than red for Polydor, so um, he was sort of sticking his neck out. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's become a, a really successful uh, cover, it's a cover that um, people all know and remember and of course the graphics are still used uh, today for the jam, uh, the sprayed uh, logo on the, on the tiled wall. Uh, so that's how the jam went. The next uh, shoot is Wham in China. Uh, really Wham were the last band that I actively worked with. Um, I shot from 1973 till possibly about 1989 and I felt really that I'd come to the end of that I was uh, doing a lot of work for advertising for cars and travel stories and work for Sunday supplements so I felt I was getting older <laughs> yeah older really and um, I thought I would um, sort of end uh, with my shoot at Wham when uh, when my career with Wham ended uh, the Wham connection started in 1984 when I went down to south of France for You magazine and photographed a feature uh, on the band. Um, the magazine had this uh, idea that um, they could dig up a lot of dirt on the, uh, on, on the band but um, Mick Brown and myself went there and they were so great, uh, they were so helpful, produced some fantastic pictures and Mick got a great story that um, they had to change their whole idea of the band and um, it came out as a very positive piece. Uh, I took the pictures along to the management and to, to see the band and they, they said, wow, um, we really like these. They used one for a cover straight away um, for their um, uh, sort of output. And then I was commissioned to photograph several other covers and most or all of the videos right up to um, George leaving, leaving the band. Um, and it's sort of... Um, was sort of getting quite um, busy with them uh, because they were so um, active as a band, touring and videos. Uh, but it was wonderful to go to China. We were the first Western band um, to go to China and it was a big deal. Um, we had a film crew with Lindsay Anderson, the film director, who came along too. Uh, we warmed up in Hong Kong and then we went to Beijing and I think Guangzhou. Uh, had a great time. I mean, it was a very strange situation. Um, the live um, concerts were, were uh, like nothing I've been to before because the first uh, sort of 20 rows were uh, party members and military people and the, the real fans, or the young people, were way back in the auditorium and actually quite restrained considering um, uh, probably because of the 20 rows of uh, authority in front of them. But it was a groundbreaking um, uh, event. We had the football match against the uh, British Embassy, which was good fun. Uh, I think we won, which was good. Uh, and then we went on a sort of official trip to the Great Wall of China. Um, I've never been to China before and it was very impressive. Uh, the wall snaked across miles and miles of mountains. And it was really quite busy. Uh, and once the um, 
the general press photographs have been taken, uh, George and Andrew and I walked up the wall a little bit away from the people and we're just doing some shots with the guys sitting there and this little Chinese guy came walking up and passed us. Um, and I managed just to take that picture because what was great about it was he was oblivious to the fact that this was Wham because he didn't know them uh, and uh, he just went and passed the time of day and we were just another bunch of tourists to him. Uh, but I love those sort of pictures, it just uh, has a humanising touch and a sort of streetwise view of the world. Uh, the rest of the tour um, went on very well, we came home, they did actually reshoot certain uh, parts of the live concerts because they didn't have enough um, action in them, um, the band didn't have that crowd reaction so they didn't feel they were really sort of putting the full froth of the uh, event into it. But um, uh, apart from that, um, the film was made um, and, and we made the first tour of China and that was just wonderful to be there. Um, I continued working with the band on videos and I ended up um, working with George on his first video which is I Want Your Sex. Um, it was uh, quite a strange time when the band did split up because um, it happened quite quickly. Unfortunately I couldn't sort of work on the the breakup as you might say, there was a big sort of uh, dinner and weekend event uh, and I was away on an assignment so I, I sort of fell out of touch and, and probably out of favour with George because um, uh, rock stars don't like being told that you, you're unavailable but I, I had another job to do and I considered myself as a professional guy and I, I couldn't come off that job and, and, and attend it so uh, that was the end of my relationship with Wham and, and sort of my end of my relationship with rock and roll as a, a photographer. Stormwatch. We're around full circle now, back to Ian Anderson, back to Jethro Tull from the first picture from the show. Um, I've worked with Ian as I say and uh, we flew up to uh, Ian's estate called Strathaird Estate on the Isle of Skye uh, to shoot pictures for the uh, Stormwatch cover, uh, the Stormwatch tour programme and the single cover uh, which was North Sea Oil. The idea was just to spend time with Ian walking around the estate uh, by the locks, on the mountains, on the moors with his animals, he had um, highland cattle uh, and to produce this sort of very sort of Scottish, uh, British, uh, North British look which worked really great. I mean I love shooting these sort of reportage stories really, you just wander around, you build up a great relationship with the guy. Um, not working too much, not pressurising him, taking time off, giving me time to look around for locations, uh, giving them, uh, the artist uh, some space, which I think is really important. Uh, the picture was great success, in fact so, so successful I went on to work with um, Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull for many years afterwards, uh, so it, it, it was proved that, that it was a winning formula. Uh, I always enjoyed working with him and um, uh, we were so lucky um, in that he asked, or I asked him to sign a set of pictures for this exhibition in Poland, which he did, 40 pictures, uh, which are maybe around the gallery, I'm not sure, but uh, they may be on display, they may not, uh, but they were, you know, he was good enough to do that, uh, he had to cancel his tour of Poland, which he was really upset about, um, so it was nice of him to do that, and it just shows you the relationship you can build up with an artist. So that concludes the uh, comments on the pictures. Uh, what I would like to say is a big thank you to everyone in Poland, uh, to the gallery and the curator and all the people who put on the exhibition, to the sound it staff and of course to, I'm going to have to try and pronounce this, to Macha uh, for all his help and his uh, enthusiasm about my pictures which um, has been great and uh, I am so sorry I'm not there to see all the pictures myself. Uh, so all I can say is a big thank you to everyone uh, and goodbye and enjoy the show. Bye-bye.